we left off with the two sides of the war finally lining up to actually fight each other. For the first time in two full chapters, we're on chapter three in a book about a war, now they're about to fight each other. Now the squadrons marshaled, captains leading each. The Trojans came with cries and the din of war like wildfowl. When the long hoarse cries of cranes sweep on against the sky, and the great formations flee from winter's grim, ungodly storms. But Achaea's armies came on strong in silence, breathing combat fury, hearts ablaze to defend each other to the death, which is immediately some amazing imagery. The cries of cranes. So the Trojans, if you can imagine, um, Sandhill cranes, you know the sounds that they make, uh, times a thousand and stampeding towards you. But then the Achaean armies, the Greek armies, just, they're, they're just staring. They're just staring at you and stampeding in silence, which is also kind of terrifying. When the south wind showers mist on the mountaintops, no friend to shepherds, better than night to thieves. You can see no farther than you can fling a stone. So dust came clouding, swirling up from the feet of armies, marching at top speed, trampling through the plain. Now closer, closing, front to front in the onset, till Paris sprang from the Trojan forward ranks. A challenger, lithe, magnificent as a god, the skin of a leopard slung across his shoulders, a reflex bow at his back, and battle sword at his hip, and brandishing two sharp spears tipped in bronze. He strode forth, challenging all the Argive best to fight him face to face in mortal combat. We have finally met Paris. Paris, who is more beautiful than he is useful. Paris, whose entire fault this is throughout the whole thing. Let's, um, let's mention, so Paris is jumping out and he is saying, I'm here, I'm amazing, come fight me. Paris is not actually dressed for war. Paris is not dressed for war. This leopard skin cloak, that's not proper sort of battle ready dress. It's more fancy than that. It's kind of more like a hunting trophy. It's there to show that he's good at something, but again, not really battle gear. So it's like he's jumping out in the middle of a battle wearing leopard print swim trunks and saying, I'm here, I have a great tan, come fight me. And in fact, somebody wants to fight him. Soon as the warrior Menelaus Menelaus, brother of Agamemnon, Menelaus, the first husband of Helen, who had given Paris a place to stay, who had been hosting Paris as his guest when Paris ran off with his wife, which was a huge no-no in many different ways. As soon as the warrior Menelaus marked him, Paris parading there with his big loping strides, please imagine that vividly, flaunting before the troops, Atrides thrilled like a lion lighting on some handsome carcass, lucky to find an antlered stag or wild goat just as hunger strikes. He rips it, bolts it down, even with running dogs and lusty hunters rushing him. So Menelaus thrilled at heart, princely Paris there, right before his eyes. The outlaw, the adulterer. Now for revenge, he thought, and down he leapt from his chariot, fully armed, and hit the ground. Beautiful note there on the fully armed. They're mentioning he's ready for battle, even if Paris isn't. But soon as magnificent Paris marked Atrides, shining among the champions, Paris's spirit shook. Backing into his friendly ranks, he cringed from death as one who trips on a snake and hilltop hollow recoils. Suddenly, trembling grips his knees, pallor takes his cheeks, and back he shrinks. So he dissolved again in the proud Trojan lines, dreading Atrides. Magnificent, brave Paris. 
you have to love the beautiful sarcasm in a 3,000 year old manuscript. Hector, crown prince of Troy, older brother of Paris and deeply embarrassed to be related to him. At one glance, Hector raked his brother with insults, stinging taunts, Paris, appalling Paris, our prince of beauty, mad for women, you lure them all to ruin. Would to God you'd never been born, had died unwed. Oh, that's all I'd ask. Better that way by far than to have you strutting here, an outrage, a mockery in the eyes of our enemies. Why, the long-haired Achaeans must be roaring with laughter. They thought you the bravest champion we could field, just because of the handsome luster on your limbs. But you have no pith, no fighting strength inside you. What, this is the man who mustered the oarsmen once? Who braved the seas in his racing deep sea ships? Trafficked with outlanders? Carried off a woman far from her distant shores? A great beauty wed to a land of rugged spearmen? You. Curse to your father, your city, and all your people. A joy to our enemies. Rank disgrace to yourself. So you can't stand up to the battling men allow us? You'd soon feel his force. That man you robbed of his warm wife? No use to you then, this fine liar, these gifts of Aphrodite, your long flowing locks and your striking looks. Now when you roll and couple with the dust, what cowards the men of Troy, or years ago they'd have decked you out in a suit of rocky armor, stoned you for death for all of the wrongs you've done. Maybe you have brothers of your own? This is, this is, this is someone who is not fond of his brother. Maybe you like your brothers. Maybe you don't like your brothers. Hector is generally saying, I wish you had never been born. You poison everything you touch. And if we'd had an ounce of gumption, we would have stoned you to death a long time ago. And Paris, magnificent as a god, replied, Oh, Hector, you criticize me fairly, yes. Nothing unfair beyond what I deserve. The heart inside you is always tempered hard, like an ax that goes through wood when a shipwreck cuts out ship timbers. So the heart inside your chest is never daunted. Still, don't fling in my face the lovely gifts of golden Aphrodite. Not to be tossed aside the gifts of the gods, these glories. Whatever the gods give their own free will, how could we ever choose them for ourselves? Which is, to summarize, yeah, that's fair. Everything that you said is fair, but don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Now, though, if you really want me to fight to the finish here, have all the Trojans and Argives take their seats and pit me against Menelaus, dear to Ares, right between the lines. We'll fight it out for Helen and all her wealth. And the one who proves a better man and wins... He'll take those treasures fairly, lead the woman home. The rest will seal in blood their binding packs of friendship. Our people will live in peace on the rich soil of Troy. Our enemies sail home to the stallion land of Argos, the land of Achaea where women are a wonder. So kind of presenting this as his own idea, even though he was absolutely pressured into doing the thing that he said he would do, Paris says, fine, I will fight Menelaus. And whoever wins the battle, wins the war. When Hector heard that challenge, he rejoiced. And right in the no man's land, along his lines, he strode, gripping his spear mid-half, staving men to a standstill. But the long-haired Argives aimed at Hector, trying to cut him down with arrows, hurling rocks till King Agamemnon cried out in a ringing voice, Hold back, Argives! Sons of Achaea, stop your salvos! Look, Hector with that flashing helmet of his, the man is trying to tell us something now. So they held their attack. Quickly, men fell silent, and Hector pleaded, appealing to both armed camps. Hear me, Trojans, Achaeans geared for combat. Hear the challenge of Paris, the man who caused our long, hard campaign. He urges all the Trojans, all the Argives too, to lay down their fine armor on the fertile earth, 
while Paris himself and the warrior Menelaus take the field between you and fight it out for Helen and all of her wealth in single combat. The one who proves the better man and wins, he'll take those treasures fairly, lead the woman home. The rest will seal in blood their binding packs of friendship. So he jumps out in front of everybody, tries not to get hit by arrows and stones, and says, hey guys, here's the plan. What do you think? And everybody is extremely excited about this. They are 100% in. What they don't feel, however, is that the people who are currently engaged in the battle, like Paris and Hector, are really trustworthy enough to seal the deal on the Trojans' end. They want the king, Priam, to really do this. So while they send messengers to go get Priam, uh, one of the gods sends a messenger to Helen, who's been hanging out and weaving and stuff, saying, hey, by the way, don't know if you know this, but the two guys that you've been married to in your life are about to duke it out for your affections. Maybe go watch. So she rushes down to the walls over top the city. Remember that cities back then would be surrounded by high, thick walls, which would keep enemies from just running in and lighting everything on fire. So she stands atop the walls, hangs out with King Priam for a little while, looks out and sees all of the Greeks, everybody that she used to know, and is able to recognize them. She starts actually like pointing out and naming different ones as Priam is asking, hey, who's that guy over there? And she talks about it. Who's that guy over there? She talks about it. She sees her first husband, Menelaus, and she's just like, oh, I miss him. I miss my life before all this happened. Hope he wins. And eventually they get Priam down to make the promise, to make a sacrifice, pray to the gods to say, this is the plan. And we are doing a solemn pinky promise on this, on this plan. And they're talking about doing that for quite a while before they actually do it. So I'm skipping all of that. They're making the sacrifice and Agamemnon stood in behalf of all, lifting his arms and prayed in his deep resounding voice, Father Zeus, ruling over us from Ida, God of greatness, God of glory, Helios, sun above us, you who sees all, hears all things, rivers, earth, and you beneath the ground who punished the dead, whoever broke his oath. By the way, I think he's talking about Persephone there, not actually Hades, but it could be either one. They don't tend to name them. They just talk about like, oh yeah, that one that you don't want to grab the attention of by specifically breaking your oaths. Be witness here, protect our binding packs. If Paris brings down Menelaus in blood, he keeps Helen himself and all of her wealth, and we sail home and are racing deep sea ships. But if red-haired Menelaus brings down Paris, the Trojans surrender Helen and all of her treasures. And then they pay us reparations, fair and fitting, a price to inspire generations still to come. But if Priam and Priam's sons refuse to pay, refuse me, Agamemnon, with Paris beaten down, then I myself will fight it out for the ransom. I'll battle here to end our long war. Let's make a note of that. They hadn't really negotiated that extra little bit at the end to say, if we win, fine, we're going home. Well, rather, if you win, fine, we're going home. If we win, we take Helen, we go home, and you have to pay us a bunch of money because this has been a huge pain in our butts. Um, and if you don't, pay the money that I've just now said that you have to pay, this addendum that I'm adding, um, we're gonna keep fighting. On those terms, he dragged his ruthless dagger across the lamb's throats and let them fall to the ground, gasping away their life breath, cut short by the sharp bronze. Then dipping up the wine from the mixing bowls, brimming their cups, pouring them on the earth, the men said their prayers to the gods who never die. You could hear some Trojan or Achaean calling Zeus, God of greatness, God of glory, all of you immortals. 
Whichever contenders trample on this treaty first, spill their brains on the ground as this wine spills. Theirs and their children's too. So they're saying, all right, the deal's been made, the terms have been set, and whoever breaks these terms, foreshadowing, whoever breaks these terms, let's make sure that they and their kids all die. But Zeus would not fulfill their prayers, not yet. Now Priam rose in their midst and took his leave. Hear me, Trojans, Achaeans geared for combat. Home I go to, I'm sorry, he's old, I should do an old voice. Home I go to Windy Ilium, straight home now. This is more than I can bear, I tell you. To watch my son do battle with Menelaus, loved by the war god right before my eyes. Zeus knows, no doubt, and every immortal too, which fighter is doomed to end all this in death. Yeah, even Priam doesn't think his kid is gonna win. So he's like, ah, cool guys, I'm out. I can't watch this. This is going to be bad. So he jumps back on his chariot, or climbs dignified back on his chariot, and leaves. They kind of measure out where they're going to be fighting. They get that all set up, and the armies, praying and stretching their hands to the gods. Father Zeus, ruling over all of us from Ida, god of greatness, glory, whoever brought this war on both our countries, let him rot and sink to the house of death. But let our packs of friendship all hold fast. The armies all want to see Paris die. The Greek armies, the Trojan armies, everybody wants to see Paris die. Nobody likes Paris. But they're totally down to be friends with each other. Like, I have nothing wrong with you, person on the other side that I might be murdering quite shortly. I have no problem with you. And they all pray this, and... Paris and Menelaus essentially rock, paper, scissors to see who goes first because the process of a one-on-one -on -one Greek fight is one person throws their spear first, tries to kill the other guy. Then the other guy, if still alive, throws their spear, tries to kill the first guy. And then if everybody's still alive, then they duke it out with swords after that. So they rock, paper, scissors. Paris gets to go first and then he has to borrow armor. Remember, he's basically out on the field in leopard print swim trunks. He's not ready to fight. So he has to borrow armor from several of his brothers. Menelaus is like, cool, I got my gear already. I'm ready to go. Both men armed at opposing sides of the forces into the no man's land between the lines they strode. Glances menacing, wild excitement seizing all who watched the stallion-breaking Trojans and Argive men-at-arms. Striking a stand in the dueling ground just cleared, they brandished spears at each other, tense with fury. Suddenly, Paris hurled. His spear's long shadow flew, and the shaft hit Menelaus's round shield full center. Not pounding through, the brazen point bent back in the tough armor. Remember that metal back then, this is before we had worked out some of the ways to make metal stronger. So it was possible for metal to bend, to break. It was a bit softer than we think of it now. But his turn next. Menelaus reared with a bronze lance and a prayer to Father Zeus. Zeus, king, give me revenge. He wronged me first. Illustrious Paris, crush him under my hand. So even among the men to come, a man may shrink from wounding the host who showers him with kindness. Shaking his spear, he hurled, and its long shadow flew, and the shaft hit Paris's round shield, hit full center. Straight through the gleaming hide, the heavy weapon drove, ripping down and in through the breastplate, finally worked, tearing the war shirt close by Paris's flank at Jad. But the Trojan swerved aside and dodged black death. So now Menelaus drew his sword with silver studs and hoisting the weapon high, brought it crashing down on the helmet ridge. But the blade smashed where it stuck. Struck. Jagged shatters flying. It dropped from Atreides' hand and the hero cried out, scanning the blank skies. Father Zeus! 
No gods more deadly than you. Here I thought I'd punish Paris for all of his outrage, but now my sword is shattered. Red my hands. My spear flew from my grip for nothing. I never hit him. And I love this imagery of this guy who's very good at fighting is like, I pray to the gods, this goes well, because man, oh man, I want to kill him. And he goes and he tries to kill him, but stuff keeps going wrong. And now he's just staring at the skies going, why? But you know, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Lunging at Paris, he grabbed his horsehair crest, swung him around, started to drag him into the Argive lines. And now the braided chin strap holding Paris's helmet tight was gouging into his soft throat. Paris was choking, strangling. Now Menelaus would have hauled him off and won undying glory. But Aphrodite, Zeus's daughter, quick to the mark, snapped the rawhide strap cut from a bludgeoned ox, and the helmet came off empty in Menelaus's fist. Whirling around, the fighter sent it flying into his archives, scrambling fast to retrieve it. And back at his man he sprang, enraged with a brazen spear, mad for the kill. But Aphrodite snatched Paris away. Easy work for a god. Wrapped him in swirls of mist and set him down in his bedroom, filled with scent. So the way that this fight went, let's break it down. Bit of an ESPN replay here. They each throw weapons at each other. They throw spears. Paris, uh, at least he aimed correctly, but he didn't throw very well and it didn't even get through the shield. Menelaus nearly killed Paris with his throw, but Paris was a little bit lucky. So then Menelaus tried to kill Paris with a sword, but that broke. Very annoying. Then he tried to just kill him manually with his hands, drag him off. But... Uh, Aphrodite, goddess of love, who prefers Paris because he's nice to her, she made sure that didn't happen. And then Menelaus was about to kill Paris again. You kind of have the idea of who's winning. And Aphrodite is like, no, we can't have that. Wraps him up in a fuzzy blanket and whisks him off to go tuck him into bed. From there, she went off herself to summon Helen found her there on the steep jutting tower with a troop of Trojan women clustered around her. The goddess reached and tugged at her fragrant robe, whispering low for all the world like an old crone, the old weaver who, when they lived in Lacod... <laughs> Man, I should know how to say that. Lacodaimon wove her fine woolens and Helen held her dear. Like her to the life, immortal love invited quickly Paris is calling for you. Come back home. There he is in his bedroom, the bed with inlaid rings. He's glistening in all his beauty and his robes. You'd never dream he's come from fighting a man. You'd think he's off to a dance or slipped away from the dancing, stretching out at ease. Enticing so that the heart in Helen's breast began to race. Oh, she knew the goddess at once, the long lithe neck the fire in those eyes, the smooth skin, and she was amazed. She burst out with her name, maddening one. My goddess, oh, what now? Lusting to lure me to my ruin once again? Where will you drive me next? Off and away to other grand, luxurious cities? Out to Phrygia, out to Mania's tempting country. Have you a favorite mortal man there too? Why now though? because Menelaus has beaten your handsome Paris and hateful as I am, he longs to take me home. She's got some, some issues of her own she needs to work out right now. Is that why you beckon here beside me now with all the immortal cunning in your heart? Well, go to him yourself. You hover beside him. Abandon the God's high road and be immortal. Never set foot on Mount Olympus, never. Suffer for Paris, protect Paris for eternity until he makes you his wedded wife, that or his slave. Oh, not I, I'll never go back again. That would be wrong, disgraceful to share that coward's bed once more. Oh, the women of Troy would scorn me down the years. The torment, the never ending heartbreak. So for one, that's kind of rude. It's kind of rude to talk to the gods that way. Now, given the genealogy of this right now, Aphrodite is also Helen's half sister. Both of them have Zeus for a father. There is that. That said, you're still not supposed to talk to a goddess that way. The essential message is, 
What? Hang on. My ex-husband won. My current husband did not. By the way, I hate my current husband. And you still want me to go be nice to my current husband? No, not going to do it. You like him so much? Don't ruin my life again. Go ruin your life to hang out with him. You like him so much, why don't you just marry him? But Aphrodite rounded on her in fury. Don't provoke me, wretched, headstrong girl. Or in my immortal rage, I may just toss you over. Hate you as I adore you now with a vengeance. I might make you the butt of hard, withering hate from both sides at once, Trojans and Achaeans. Then your fate can tread you down to dust. So she threatened, and Helen, the daughter of mighty Zeus, was terrified. Shrouding herself in her glinting silver robes, she went along in silence. None of her women saw her go. The goddess led her away. And once they arrived at Paris's sumptuous halls, the attendants briskly turned to their own work as Helen and all her radiance climbed the steps to the bedroom under the high vaulting roof. There, Aphrodite quickly brought her a chair, the goddess herself with her everlasting smile, and set it down face to face with Paris. There, Helen sat, Helen, the child of Zeus, whose shield is storm and lightning, glancing away, lashing out at her husband. So, home from the wars. Oh, would to God you died there, brought down by that great soldier, my husband of long ago. How you used to boast, year in, year out, that you were a better man than fighting Menelaus, better in power, arm, and spear. So why not go back now? Hurl your challenge at Menelaus, dear to Ares. Fight it out together, man to man again. Wait, take my advice. Call a halt right here. No more battling with fiery-haired Menelaus, pitting strength against strength in single combat. Madness, he just might impel you on his spear. So again, the sass and saltiness of this 3,000 year old dialogue. She is just roasting him, saying, hey, remember how you used to brag all the time that you would be able to do this? You weren't able to do this. Why don't you go do it again? You know why you're not doing it again? Cause you'll die, cause you suck. Wish you were dead. But Paris replied at once to Helen's challenge. No more, dear one, don't rake me with your taunts, myself and all my courage. This time, true Menelaus has won the day, thanks to Athena. By the way, Athena did not feature in that fight at all. One goddess only interfered, and that was Aphrodite. I'll bring him down tomorrow. Even we have gods on our side who battle with us. But come, let's lose ourselves in love. Never has longing for you overwhelmed me so. No, not even then, I tell you, that first time when I swept you up from the lovely hills of Lacodiamon sailed you off and away in the racing deep sea ships and we went to love each other on a rocky island that was nothing to how i long for you now irresistible once lay me low yeah so again he has absolutely no no argument for the fact that he definitely is a terrible person is not good at anything and people keep telling him that they wish he was dead he has no real comeback for that just like never you mind that i'll get him tomorrow if at first you don't succeed try try again by the way i really like you you're very pretty let's go to bed and while the two of them were in bed menelaus stalked like a wild beast up and down the lines where could he catch a glimpse of magnificent Paris? Not a single Trojan, none of their famous allies could point out Paris to battle-hungry Menelaus. Not that they would hide him out of friendship, not even if someone saw him. All of them hated him like death, black death. That's his own side, by the way. That's his own side saying, wow, no, if we had him, we'd give him to you. We hate him too. But Marshal Agamemnon called out to the armies, Hear me now, you Trojans, Dardans, Trojan allies. Clearly victory goes to Menelaus, dear to Ares. You must surrender Helen and all of her treasure with her at once and pay us reparations fair and fitting, a price to inspire generations still to come. So Atrides demanded and his armies roared assent. End of chapter three.